The plan for this video was simple. Pick up an HP Z440 workstation, chuck in a ton of upgrades, and see if this decade-old system can still pull its weight as a budget workstation or home server. And well, yeah, that's exactly what I did. But this whole process turned out to be quite a bit more interesting than I expected. Some of this was due to less than ideal choices made by HP, shocker, but I also uncovered some really helpful features and even stumbled across a useful trick that I had never heard of before. I was actually really impressed with this machine's final form, but getting there was definitely a bit of a roller coaster. It actually worked! Oh my god! That being said, roller coasters are fun, so let's get started. Now, to upgrade a system like this, we're going to need a lot of different components, like a better CPU, more RAM, and also a ton of storage. I'm not a big fan of spending an arm and a leg on hard drives though, which is why I often turn to manufacturer recertified drives from server part deals, the sponsor of today's video. Actually, they didn't just sponsor this video, they also sent over five 24 terabyte Seagate Exos drives for me to use in this project. If you're not familiar with server part deals, they're one of the largest suppliers of manufacturer recertified drives, and their pricing can save you a ton of money. That means you can grab larger capacities or even pick up an extra drive or two as spares, all while staying under your budget. Now, I know some people are hesitant about non-new drives, but server part deals recertified drives come straight from the manufacturer and go through extensive testing. They check smart data, run read-write tests, do performance benchmarking, and even perform sector scans to verify every part of the drive. Honestly, the chances of getting a dead-on-arrival drive are sometimes lower than with brand new ones. In fact, I actually recently had a few brand new Seagate drives fail in my TrueNAS server, and I swapped those out with research from server part deals. On top of the great selection and pricing, server part deals also offers free two-day shipping on all orders, top-notch packaging to ensure safe delivery, and an incredible support team to help with any technical issues or RMAs. If you're looking to stretch your budget and still get high quality storage, make sure to check out server part deals today by using my link down in the description. And if you use code Haven, you can get $5 off any order. I've been wanting to make a video on the HP Z440 for a while now. These workstation systems are roughly a decade old at this point, so not exactly cutting edge, but they're pretty easy to find and fairly inexpensive. While the Haswell and Broadwell Xeon CPUs that it supports aren't going to be incredible in terms of performance, they're becoming cheaper and cheaper each day and might still provide plenty of horsepower for certain workloads and also allow for a lot of memory. That being said, the real draw of these budget workstations isn't the CPU, it's the features and room for expandability that they offer. So like I said, I decided to snag one, load it up with hardware, and see if it could serve as a capable budget workstation or a versatile all-in-one home server. But before we start with any upgrades, let's take a look at the system I picked up. I found this Z440 locally on Facebook Marketplace, and while it's hard to tell exactly how much I paid for it, because I bought both the Z440 and a laptop for $200. Here in the US though, you can often find these selling on eBay for around or even under $100. Overall, it's a pretty simple looking system with modest IO on the front and back. On the front, there are four USB 3 Type A ports, 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks, and the power button. Above that is a slim DVD drive and two blank 5 and a quarter inch bays. On the back, there are a few more USB ports and audio jacks, and then a gigabit Ethernet port. And here you'll notice that it says AMT. That's because this supports Intel's active management technology, which, if set up, can give you some helpful remote management features. We'll take a look at that later on, though. The system gets a lot more interesting if we take off the side panel. Now, I accidentally messed up and forgot when I filmed this teardown that I had already taken off this shroud, which has some fans for the memory. But you can see here from a later clip that all you have to do is pinch these two little tabs and then pull it out. It actually just connects to the motherboard via this little six pin header. With the cover and shroud off, we can see all eight memory sockets, which can support quad channel DDR4 registered ECC memory. Below that, there are a variety of PCIe slots, two of which are Gen 3x16, as well as an older PCI slot. There are also six SATA ports, but sadly with this system, there aren't any M.2 NVMe slots. Now to power all of these potential PCIe devices and hard drives, there's a, one second, yeah, a 700 watt power supply. And it even comes with two six pin PCIe connectors for a GPU. Speaking of GPUs, the graphics card in this can easily be removed thanks to the fact that most maintenance in this system can be done toolless. Now this GPU is not what I was expecting, as I assumed this would have some sort of NVIDIA NVS or Quadro card, but it actually came with what I eventually found out was an AMD R7 250, which I doubt I'm going to get much use out of. I'm also probably not going to get much use out of the 320GB or 500GB hard drives, but I will make use of the two empty 3.5-inch drive bays. 
My system came with just one 8GB stick of DDR4, which isn't terrible, but considering this has 8 sockets, it feels like barely anything. I took off the CPU heatsink to find the Xeon underneath, which was an E5 1620v4. Now this 4 core 8 thread chip isn't all that exciting, but like I said, we will be upgrading it. Before upgrading anything though, I needed to get this thing cleaned up because, well, it was pretty dusty. Now normally this is the part of the video where I take everything out of the system and then dust it out of my back porch, but it was raining so I had to clean up everything in my garage. My garage is an eyesore at the moment though, so rather than making you endure watching that, I figured you might just enjoy some soothing rain sounds. After getting everything cleaned up, putting the system back together was as easy as... With all of the dust cleaned out, I was actually pretty impressed with just how clean this system looked. Also, you might be wondering why I put this back together as is, rather than tossing in some sweet upgrades. And this was partially because I wanted to run some benchmarks with the original system, just for a baseline, but mostly it was because I wanted to update the BIOS to the most recent version, just to make sure it would support any newer CPUs. Now I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit here, but I did look around in the BIOS just a bit, and was sort of disappointed that I couldn't find a feature that I was really hoping for, PCIe bifurcation. This essentially lets you split up the PCIe lanes into smaller chunks, and it's perfect for something like having a quad NVMe card like this one. This could help a lot if you're using this either as a workstation or as a home server by letting you have multiple NVMe SSDs for faster speeds and redundancy. However, if this doesn't support bifurcation, it makes doing this much more expensive. Bifurcation should be supported by the CPU and chipset, but sadly, it's not there. That is until I actually updated the BIOS, and all of a sudden bifurcation was available, and this, this actually really surprised me. It actually worked! Oh my god! I can't believe that did it! With the most up-to-date BIOS installed, it was time to upgrade the CPU- With the most recent BIOS installed, and a system that was definitely powered down, it was time to upgrade the CPU. Now I could have gone for something crazy like the E5-2699V4, which has 22 cores and 44 threads. Or I could have also gone with something like the 2697v4, which only has 18 cores, but I found you can get these for stupid cheap at like $30 on eBay. What I ended up going with instead was the E5-2687wv4, and if you're wondering why, well, that's a great question with a really long and boring answer. But the short story is, I couldn't wait a week for a different CPU to come in, so I ended up just going with this. Now it's only a 12 core 24 thread chip, but it's not all bad. With it being a W or workstation CPU, this does have a higher base and turbo frequency than most of the other high core count chips. So hopefully with the 12 cores, it can still be a decent performer with multi-threaded tasks, but also have better single threaded performance. Now I didn't go crazy and put this CPU's 1.5 terabyte memory capacity to the test, but I did pick up eight 32 gigabyte sticks for a total of 256 gigabytes of registered ECC DDR4. And after getting all that installed, the system posted without any issues. As excited as I was to see what this could do as a home server, I first wanted to see if it could potentially be a solid yet relatively inexpensive workstation. For most workloads, an R7 250 isn't going to cut it, so I wanted to swap out the GPU. Sadly, the best card I had available was an RTX 3060 12 gig, but it requires two 8-pin connectors. The Z440 only has dual 6 pins. The next best GPU I had on hand was an RTX A2000, but I don't have the full height bracket, so I grabbed the third best GPU I have, which is an RTX 3056 gig. That booted up just fine, but the Nvidia drivers failed to install because, well, my SSD was full. For some reason, I thought I grabbed a 256 gig SSD, but I accidentally installed Windows onto a 128 gig SSD. Normally this wouldn't have been that big of a deal, but well, it turns out Windows has some issues when you have twice as much RAM as you do storage. After a bit of tinkering, I managed to get the hibernation file size down just a bit, and I was able to install the drivers. But I also added a second SSD just to give myself a bit more breathing room. I also tossed in a 10 gig SFP Plus card so that I could quickly access files and projects from my TrueNet server. With a bit more space, I installed DaVinci Resolve to test out some video editing and rendering. Editing a 4K timeline was mostly pretty smooth, with most hiccups seemingly due to a GPU limitation rather than a CPU limitation. When rendering out the timeline, I opted to just use the CPU rather than GPU for encoding, and this probably isn't the most realistic use case, but would provide a bit more of an apples to apples comparison to my personal editing PC. And well, the result wasn't that great, with the render taking about four times as long as my Ryzen 3950X. Now to be fair, the 3950X has more cores, higher clock speeds, is much newer, and is much more expensive on the used market. 
I also ran the Blender benchmarking tool, and here the Broadwell Xeon looked a little bit better in comparison. The 3950X was between just 65 to 90% faster, depending on which of the three tests you look at. I also ran Cinebench R23, and here I have a lot more data to pull from from a variety of systems. First, I have the original configuration of the HP Z440 with the E51620V4. I also grab numbers for a little mini PC with an Intel N100, the MS01 with its i9-13900H, and the Dell Optiplex with a Ryzen 7 1700. When looking at the multi-threaded results, the 2678WV4 performed pretty well, only being outclassed by the much more modern i9-13900H. If we look at the single-threaded benchmark though, things don't look nearly as good, with the 2678WV4 actually being the worst performer. The 13900H still takes a massive lead, and this is also a decent example of how solid the N100 can be in single-threaded workloads when compared to systems from just a few years ago. If we take a look at total system power draw, the Z440 with the E52678WV4 doesn't look all that great. In fact, when running Cinebench R23, this was the highest power draw I've had of any system I've tested on the channel at 192 watts. The idle power draw at 47 watts isn't that great, but it's also important to keep in mind that this was with the R7250 installed. If we were able to remove that, the power draw might be a little bit lower. This last chart here is just showing the Cinebench R23 multi-threaded results alongside the total system power while running the benchmark. And this just goes to show how something much more modern like the i9-13900H can perform significantly better while drawing roughly half the power. If you're looking for a workstation where CPU performance and efficiency is your top priority, this might not be the best solution. However, if your workloads primarily just require you to have a ton of memory or access to a lot of PCIe slots, this might actually be a decent option. The CPU performance is pretty lackluster, but you're probably going to struggle to affordably build or find a system where you can chuck in 256 gigs of RAM or have access to 40 PCIe lanes. So depending on the use case, even a decade after its release, this could be a potential workstation option. But all of that RAM and all of those PCIe slots could also be really helpful in a home server situation, especially if you were looking to essentially run your entire home lab all within one system. For this, I installed Proxmox as a hypervisor. I also wanted to see if this system would run headless or without a GPU to try and cut down on the power usage. Now, I've rarely run into issues when doing this, but when I tried to boot the Z440 without a GPU, it was not happy and proceeded to tell me about it in the form of some very angry beeps. This was sort of odd because I've done this with plenty of systems and I sort of expected with this being a workstation that, well, it would just work or at least be an option, but when I looked in the BIOS to see if there was any sort of headless mode option or the option to disable a warning, there was nothing. I started to just accept it and move on, but I figured if I was wrong for some reason, I would never hear the end of it in the comments, so I decided to dig a little bit deeper, and I eventually ended up stumbling across a Reddit thread talking about an older Z240, and there someone mentioned using HP's BIOS configuration utility. Now, I had never heard of this before, but I downloaded it and tinkered around for a little bit and eventually was able to get the config from the BIOS. And here I was able to find a value called Headless Boot. Now, you're supposed to be able to set that value to Enabled with a capital E, but for some reason, whenever I would try to do that, it seemed like the application was just changing it to all lowercase regardless of what I tried. So rather than using the application to set the value, I instead just saved the entire configuration to a text file, edited that one value, and then set the config using my edited file. And after that, no more angry beeps. It's really annoying that these hidden BIOS options exist in the first place, but I am glad that I found this software because who knows, it might come in handy in the future. Without a GPU while sitting idle in Proxmox, the system was drawing around 38 watts, but after running PowerTop's autotune function and setting the scaling governor to power save, I got it to drop down to around 35 watts. Now at this point, Proxmox was just installed on a SATA SSD, but knowing that bifurcation was an option, I decided to install two NVMe SSDs via that quad PCIe adapter. After enabling BI4 bifurcation on that slot, I was able to install Proxmox to both NVMe SSDs using a ZFS mirror for some redundancy, and the Z440 had no issues booting via PCIe. And with that done, it was time to deck this thing out. You would think that after going through all the trouble of getting this thing to boot without a GPU that I wouldn't want to immediately put one back in, but I figured a GPU might be helpful for some tasks like transcoding. I didn't want to use the top slot again because, well, I didn't want to block some of the slots beneath it, but the 3056 gig was just a little bit too big to fit in the bottom by 16 slot. It's not quite as sexy, but the Quadro P620 can still do a decent job at some hardware accelerated transcoding. I also added the 10 gig SFP Plus card back in, as well as a quad Intel 2.5 gigabit NIC, which was able to go into the Gen 2x4 slot. 
For some more storage, I added two more NVMe SSDs to fill up the quad adapter, and also started dropping in the 24 terabyte hard drives from server part deals. The first drive was easy, but for the second, well, I needed another drive tray. I was able to find a simple model to 3D print, but for some reason in the slicer there was a gap here, so it ended up coming out in multiple pieces, making it a little bit more difficult to assemble. It also didn't help that in true Hardware Haven fashion, I put it on backwards the first time. For the other three hard drives, I pulled out this 3-bay adapter that I've used in the past from IC Dock, which would go in the two 5 and a quarter inch bays on the front. Before sliding it in, I plugged in some SATA cables as well as a power splitter just to make life a little bit easier. I probably could have slid it a little bit further back so that it was flush with the front of the case, but I preferred to have a little bit of extra breathing room on the back. I was a little bit concerned about heat with all of these PCIe cards bunched up together. Plus, there was just this big empty space in the bottom corner just begging for something. So I found a model for attaching a 92mm fan to the front, but I made some tweaks to it to fit an 80mm fan since I didn't have any 92mm fans on hand. And then to really make sure that airflow got back to the PCIe cards, I designed a really simple duct and printed that out. It was a little awkward, but I eventually got everything snapped into place. Now there is another case fan header on the motherboard that wasn't being used, but I wanted this little knock to a fan to really push some air, so I just hooked it up using a Molex adapter. And with all of that crammed into the case, I powered it on and, well, it booted up just fine. All the cards were recognized and working, and you could feel that the little fan was actually moving quite a bit of air through the PCIe cards. With all of that hardware, I had a lot of options for virtual machines and containers, and I started off by setting up an instance of TrueNAS scale. I configured the 10 gig SFP Plus card as a bridge, and then passed through a virtual 10 gig NIC to TrueNAS. I also passed through both SATA controllers with PCIe pass-through, but well, here I was a little concerned because one of the controllers shared an IOMMU group with the system management bus, but passing that through as well didn't seem to cause any noticeable issues. To have a little bit of flash storage available, I also passed through the third and fourth NVMe SSDs. Oh, and I also configured this VM with 128 gigs of RAM since, well, you know, I have 256. After setting up networking and some pools, I had a pretty decent little TrueNAS box with plenty of caching, almost 100 terabytes of usable hard drive space, as well as some NVMe flash storage. Setting up hardware accelerated transcoding with the NVIDIA GPU was a bit of a pain, but I eventually got it working in a Jellyfin LXC container. I also ran an instance of OpenSense, passing through the quad Intel NIC so that I could run a forbidden virtualized router, and then I set up a few more VMs and containers like Home Assistant, as well as Crafty Controller, where the 24 threads and 128 gigs of RAM was easily able to run multiple Minecraft servers. Now with all that hardware, the system was no longer pulling just 35 watts, and instead was typically sitting at around 115 watts or so. Now sure that's not amazing, but if you were to split all of these workloads out across multiple systems with a dedicated router and NAS, odds are you'd likely see the total power draw be close to something like that. So it's not that terrible considering all of the hardware packed into this thing. Oh yeah, earlier I mentioned that this supports Intel's AMT platform for remote management, and I did give that a shot. When booting up the system, you can hold down Control-P to get to the MEBX setup menu, and after creating an admin password, I was able to configure and apply the network settings. Then using an application called Mesh Central, you can access the machine using AMT. I've had decent luck in the past with certain systems, but the only functionality I was able to work out here was being able to power on and off the system. I wasn't expecting to get KVM access since the system doesn't have integrated graphics, but I also wasn't able to get serial over LAN working either. This might've been due to the fact that I was getting a warning that I needed to update the AMT firmware, but the provided link wasn't, well, all that helpful. I didn't care to spend too much more time on this though, and honestly a cheap KVM solution might be the better option anyway. So I finally got to make a video on the HP Z440, but well, how do I feel about it? Honestly, it was a bit more of a pain to tinker with than I was expecting, but once I got some of the kinks worked out, it was a pretty solid little system. <laughs> well, well, not a little system, it's, it's pretty big, but it's definitely still capable even 10 years after its release. High core count Broadwell Xeons are becoming extremely affordable, and registered ECC DDR4 is also getting less expensive over time, so there are a lot of upgrade possibilities. And that's not even mentioning the 40 available PCIe lanes, storage options, and features that you can often only get with more professionally geared systems. So this could be a good option if, let's say, you're specifically needing a high core count server, and you also want to be able to leverage bifurcation to get access to, like, eight NVMe SSDs or something. Or maybe you need a budget workstation for an application that really just needs tons and tons of memory. Or maybe you just want to pick up a cheap system that isn't perfect, but is a lot of fun to tinker with, and, well, this thing was definitely able to do that. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, maybe drop a like and consider subscribing. 
If you want to support the channel even more and get access to some cool perks, maybe consider becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. With that, you get early access to all my videos without any ads. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.